division, that's all the staff that keeps things going. <clears throat> and that includes the graduate student assistantships that we also offer. We consider them our employees. Um, as I mentioned, that we have a, a big research budget that requires us to have facilities to do the work. Um, we are very taxed in terms of classroom space. You know, we're thankful for the new buildings on campus like Gallagher and others that have the wonderful kinds of audiovisual equipment that really helps in student learning. Uh, we'd really like to have more of that ourselves. We invested some of our own money into the CLAP building to modernize one of the classrooms there, as well as a couple on the forestry building. Uh, those are wonderful rooms and we use them greatly. And we dearly love our building and our location on campus, but we recognize uh, how important it is for us to be able to, to service the needs of both our research and our students and our service functions. So thank you for your attention here. I, I don't know if that's the kind of detail, yeah. Rosie, that you wanted, um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, thank you for your attention. Committee members, have questions for Jim? <coughs> Ron. Jim, one time I saw, I believe there was a talk, and I think I saw some renderings of some uh, expansion or modernization of the current forestry building. Is that still a project that's alive? Yes, it is, as a matter of fact. Um, Perhaps you're referring to one of the designs that was here when I first came, uh, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit more background than perhaps you want, but to directly answer your question, yes, there is still even some drawings that would have a building connecting the journalism building to the forestry building in that parking lot there, and unify those two buildings and, and make that one complex that would service all of our needs. In other words, we would consolidate everything in one building, and that would be quite satisfactory. It's not, as I understand, on the campus master plan, though, and so I don't know how far that original idea got, and that's probably 97, <coughs> something like that, when that came out. I guess my question would be, if that happened, would you still need additional facility, perhaps, in the South Campus? Probably not. If we were able to acquire that space uh, in journalism and that space in between and build a building, and of course it would be a very modern building that would use uh, minimal amounts of energy, much of it below grade, uh, to be able to service our needs, I think it would, it would be adequate. And perhaps I, I can, Ron, I can expand a little bit more if, if I might, and I'm sure some of the audience is familiar with this. We had a proposal uh, to be able to have a joint building with the United States Forest Service is Rocky Mountain uh, Research Station, who occupies those buildings right along Beckwith. Uh, you probably all know the Aldo Leopold Wilderness Research Institute. There's another small building there, the Forest Sciences Laboratory, it's called. There's even another kind of modular building there that used to be called the Insect Lab. Um, we were talking with the Forest Service very seriously, and in fact, they invested $150,000 of federal resources to draw architectural drawings of a new joint building that we would occupy with the United States Forest Service. We work quite closely with the researchers on a whole series of projects. Um, because of the federal budget, uh, it looks grim. As a matter of fact, uh, I sure wouldn't be betting anything on that building being built with federal dollars. Thank you. Uh, my understanding, Jim, though, is that that, that will continue to be pursued. <coughs> It, it will. Uh, Perry Brown, as a matter of fact, is in Washington, D.C., uh, doing his best work uh, in terms of being able to understand what opportunities there might be for these plans to be manifest. Um, I guess maybe I'm pessimistic, and I shouldn't be. There, the possibility still is out there, yeah, but, yeah. but I, I'm, I'm just not Cautiously, that. very cautiously optimistic, yes. especially the way things have happened with federal funding, I mean, yes. the decrease in federal funding for those kinds. And, and to follow up with Ron's question, if we were able to acquire that building as planned, we would not need other facilities. That would be adequate for us. Thanks, Jim. What about the location for that building? When I was on committee campus facilities, they talked about putting it behind the now the clock building. Is that still where it could potentially go, or would it need to go on South Campus? Uh, I have no indication the Forest Service is interested in, in moving to South Campus. They have a long-term lease in the location that they have now in Beckwith. And so I, I don't know the nuances of what, what their desire to move might be. This is Keith, I'm sorry. That's right. With that building, one that was proposed as a joint effort School of Forestry and Forest Service. Weren't there some interesting problems with sound and 
all kinds of things that in campus. Well, every bit <clears throat> that we're building lab facilities on the south side of campus, we're right at the threshold for going over the limit at 10 o'clock at night, which is a city ordinance. So, so we're, every building we build, we're mitigating the sound uh, with each additional building we put over there. So the next building that goes up there may have a problem. No, because we're going back to existing buildings and putting sound dampening uh, screens on some of the HVAC equipment, like on the science building. We're doing that right now, in fact, as part of the roofing project. So the mitigation <coughs> mechanical equipment, is that what? Primarily. Primarily. What about uh, existing and then projected square footage or square acreage needs the apartment? I, I'd say that, you know, we have uh, estimates of need in, in addition of uh, 30 to 50,000 square feet. And 30,000 square feet right now to be able to take care of the research needs that we have that we're scattered all over and kind of doing on a, in the back rooms and closets that we can find. Uh, we have made promises to the faculty that we have recruited for a watershed, a wildlife and or, or, wildlife, uh, energy development labs, and we don't have them. We've been kind of holding this carrot out that we're going to have this new building at the Forest Service for a while, and, uh, and it hasn't happened yet. It, Kevin, I just have a question yes. on the, um, the um, and you might not have the answer, but on the journalism school, all that, that has been totally allocated out because of pressing needs in other areas. Right, the gym center, they're getting the basement and maybe other small area in there, but the rest of it's going to arts and sciences. The so existing we, journalism building. The existing, right. yeah, not the Anderson Hall. So in the event that that were to, if, if this ever were to work out for forestry, then we still have a lot of departments that would be displaced with no place to go. That's correct. Okay. Teresa, in the original plan, there was a committee pulled together to figure out the allocation space for the journalism building. And forestry is an area that requested that uh, space initially. They were among the seven uh, groups that requested space, and they were granted it by the committee. And so in this particular instance, it sounds like they may be the only ones that were allocated space on a permanent basis that will be able to get it uh, fairly quickly because the other needs related to the law school accreditation are basically going to defer the other group which was um, the College of Arts and Sciences, computer science area in particular, from moving into floors two and three. Okay, so uh, that's it. Um, Teresa, what, what, what were the demand? Did you, was there Far more. I mean, I don't know, but I'm imagining that the 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 express need for space was far greater than anything that could be. It was, but in the case of forestry, they asked for a circumscribed amount of space that they was an immediate need that they felt they could get. Okay. So it's not as though they asked for considerably more than they received. Their request was modest. And the committee was very much agreeable to their request. Okay. Trace, do I understand that the top two or three floors will be used by law during the renovation of the law school? That's my understanding. And by the people that that renovation will displace. Because there are those two homes on Eddy that are by the law school. And they're going, those homes are going to have to be torn out. And so those individuals will be displaced as well. And I know one uh, tenant in one of the houses is counseling psychology. They have their interns there uh, providing clinical services for the community. So they will have to be displaced. So tem temporary swing space is what you're talking about. Bob, I know I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, the so the, in the current forestry building and the nooks and crannies you have people and staff and now do you know how many square feet that is that you're using currently and then is this 30 to 50,000 in addition to that or just in addition to yeah, that okay. 
I can't give you a figure, yeah. I would guess. I, I know that we were talking about a 120,000 square foot building in that new building that we would have with right. four service. Would that be the ideal scenario to have you know, the brand new building on South Campus, 120,000 square feet, or were you saying that your ideal scenario was to go back to a renovation expansion of the current forestry building on the main campus? Well, we, we have really not gone as far down that road as we perhaps might have. Uh, you know, Teresa was right about us asking for a little and getting some. We felt like half a loaf was better than none. And so we've been trying to piece together and solve immediate problems. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's tough for me to say which is the better scenario for us. We are kind of have to be pragmatic. One of the things I probably should be real clear about when I asked the academics to come, it wasn't specifically to speak about whether they'd be interested in uh, being out at South Campus. It's just knowing that there are needs, so they probably aren't in a position that they could feel real comfortable speaking to that simply because it's just more about we know there are needs, so how might we be able to address some of those needs? Further questions? Mike? Well, more on a follow-up on Teresa's, the, the occupants of the 724 Eddy and 730 Eddy, they're being moved into two houses on 6th Street. Or just two houses and all of that. And another thing about the journalism building, the uh, registrar was one of the departments that was wanting to either preserve some of the classrooms that were there or try to get another one in there. Um, constantly on the list for looking for room. Yeah, ter terrible demands, I know, for classrooms. I think they just on the campus. lost one in the main hall, I believe, to the Committee for Civic uh, Engagement. Engagement. Any questions? Right. And this, the classroom space the registrars want, I assume, is for general classroom, not the specific type classrooms that Jim was speaking right. Right. Okay. And they specifically want large classrooms, if at all possible, for the gym ed courses. In buildings with elevators, that was the other criteria they wanted. That has a really good elevator to that facility, so they could get to the upper floors. To be able to accommodate ADA. ADA. Good. Thanks, Jim. That was just what we were looking for. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, now I would ask uh, Bill Woosner. If Bill, you want to come on up? <laughs> Do you want to come on up here? Bill, you can face the committee. Again, I'd like to introduce Bill Woosner, who is a um, faculty member in, our, in the Department of Geosciences. Well, one time on is geology. We're broad, and that's part of the discussion. Well, thank you very much for for asking me to make a presentation. I, I'm not representing a college exactly. I mean, I'm in the College of Arts and Sciences, but I'm certainly not speaking for the College of Arts and Sciences. But just you know, Jim's kind of presentation was from needs for the whole College of. Uh, Forestry and conservation. I get that name right. You got it right. See, they change their name too. <laughs> I get mixed up all the time. Um, I think the the purpose for me being here was uh, just a request. Could you talk a little bit about, from a department point of view, how things have changed and why we're even talking about these space issues? And, and are there space issues? Does the South Campus potential solve those? I have no idea. Um, you know that discussion. I'd certainly like to have with somebody you know, somewhere down the line, but that's not my purpose. My purpose is really to talk a little bit about from a department point of view. I came here 26 years ago, and when I came here 26 years ago, we had about 10, 11, 12, I guess we had 11 to 12 faculty in the Department of Geology. We had about probably the same number of undergraduates as we have now, and maybe half the graduate students. Well. As far as, you know, facilities, you figure, and we were in the science complex, which is the CLAP building, uh, that is, we're on the third floor of that, we got to our space. We're on the third floor of that building. We have half of the space on the first floor, and we have space in the basement, and we have space at Fort Missoula in the field research laboratory that we share with the biologists, the bird aviary uh, sort of space out there. 
Um, so that's kind of where how we're set up. So again, we had about 12 faculty, 11 to 12 faculty when I first came here. Now the difference is, is that when I came here, I had my prompts. See, what we needed to do our science was something like this. We had we had a burning <laughs> compass, that we could use. and then uh, let's see what else we got in here. Oh, we had a pop camera. <laughs> I have to put, not only loses, this is uh, grants I got for And we had a topographic map uh, to help us sort of map the geology. When I came here, I was the first groundwater person, so I got a steel tape to measure water levels in wells. Now, this cost $350 at that time, right? It's very, you know, gradual tape and stuff. So that was kind of the toolbox that a lot of us started with. And my colleagues before me, who were already there, this was what they did. You know, geology always needed the oldest building. It needed, the, you know, all you got to do is store rocks there and stuff. So what do you, you, know, you don't really need much of a facility. You just need some office space and that kind of thing. Um, and these were kind of some of the basic tools. Now, my colleagues are going to kill me if I don't tell you that we're still using these basic tools. <laughs> but times have changed. And that's part of the demand on the university facilities. We now have, a, a, we probably have 40 graduate students. 16 of them are PhD students. We, when I first got here, we probably had a half a million dollars worth of research money. Now we have five to ten million dollars worth of research money. When we bring in a new faculty member, we expect that fac faculty member to come from the finest university in the country, to already have numbers of publications, and to hit the ground running with uh, research and mentoring students and advancing science. And those costs become much different than what we started with and what we used to do. So part of our spatial needs are is that when we bring in new faculty and as we change directions, instead of just mapping the, the, the rock surfaces looking for oil and gas and minerals, we're looking at climate issues, we're looking at going to Pakistan and, and worrying about earthquakes. We have folks going to Brazil and studying what's happening in those parts of the world. We're looking at water issues and, uh, across the, the Northwest. So we're actually doing a lot of different things than we did when we first started out. And so as a result of that, we're just bursting at the seams. We, we lost a faculty member last year because that faculty member left. When they came, we said, OK, we're going to help you do certain things, build certain equipment, give you certain lab space, and we couldn't make that happen within that time period, and they went and found a job that allowed them to have those kinds of facilities that they needed to do science and to train students in modern concepts and train them to be, uh, you know, educated citizens. So, uh, also the, the CLAP building, the science complex, has some other interesting features, and we have a little bit of asbestos around there which uh, you've probably heard some about. And so the whole building is going to be renovated. And next year we're going to move out, as the fourth floor did the year before. Um, and we have no place to go in the sense of lab we have laboratories. We have, you know, have clean labs that are doing top-level research, but we have no place to put them yet. Now, we're going to resolve that. We, we have to resolve that. But there's no swing space anywhere on campus. We're just totally full. And when we bring on a new faculty member, we try to expand in an area, we have no place to put them. We can, if we can get our office, that's great, but lab space or other facilities is very difficult. Now, why do we need all of that stuff? Well, we need to do modern science. I mean, you're paying us to train the students of Mon the residents of Montana to be the top of their field, to be competitive, to be able to work in their fields. And to do that, we need the equipment, and we need the space, and we need the teachers to allow us to do that. And so that's kind of where we are. I mean, it's, it's a fascinating point. We just don't, we're not over there just sort of giving our 100 lecture to 500 students and trying to hope they learn something about our field. But it becomes, it's much more than just teaching in the classroom for, and doing undergraduate education. That's an extremely important part of what we do. I mean, you're all aware of that. But the other part of it is making a difference in the world, making a difference in Montana. And to do that, we, we need to keep growing. And the, our problem with space in the past seems to be that we're always building on the edge of, of what we need. So as soon as the space is completed, it's, to, it's completed, it's totally taken. Because we were waiting for it. 
I mean, you know, we needed it, you know, five years ago, and we fill it as soon as it comes up, and then we need the next building, but, you know, then we need the next chunk of space. And, you know, to really plan and to, and to be able to grow, uh, we need some space that's better planned out and is more applicable to doing science in particular. That's, of course, my interest. Now, I have to put a plug in here for this, that other college, the College of Forestry and <laughs> Conservation. I guess that's right. Okay. Um, we like, the, the new word in, in science, as, you're, as you've been reading, and I'm sure you're aware, is interdisciplinary work. Being able to do interdisciplinary science. That's part of what Jim was talking about. They have a pretty diverse college, and he's saying, you know, you like to see people able, better able to interact. Well, I'm in a totally different field, but I want to work with these guys. I want to be able to have my group be on the same floors and the same buildings, ideally, with the folks that are in the School of Forestry and Conservation, even though I'm in the College of Arts and Sciences. But to solve these really big problems, we can't do it as an individual researcher or one or two people. You need these teams of people who have, who have this wide range of activities. We do that already on campus, but an ideal situation would be to be able to have a facility where you would actually be able to promote interdisciplinary science. And I think the University of Montana would use that as a calling card to sell what we do here to this, for the state and for the region. You know, we do interdisciplinary science, but we need some help figuring out how to do that. And right now, every floor that he, you know, how do you get that piece of space over here? Because I want to, I've got to talk to Teresa. Because every, I mean, we need space desperately. And, uh, and, and, and I'm not, I think I speak for most of my colleagues in other departments, and it's not just the sciences necessarily, it's other departments on campus too. They're, they need better quality space and they could really benefit from it. So, I mean, we're just not saying, give me, give me, in a sense, where we went from a research program of less than a few million to tens of millions of dollars, and that's part of the training. We're supplying, bringing that money in to help train those students. We're not asking the state to give it to us. We're bringing that in independent of all of that to try to educate folks and to buy facilities. So that's kind of our story. I mean, we have a new mercury analyzer to do very low level mercury concentrations in environmental things like water particularly. And it's sitting in the lab right now wondering, you know, we want to get it set up and use it. It cost about $250,000. But it needs to be put in a clean laboratory. Well, we have clean. We have a special clean laboratory space. It already has another piece of equipment in there. But again, we need actually separate lab space to appropriately run that piece of equipment. And that's just the first new faculty. There'll be new equipment and new demands on that kind of space. But that high quality research space. I, you know, I heard somebody talk about Steve Steve running over in the school of of a forestry. I mean, as I said, we hired the highest quality faculty from the best universities in the country. Montana attracts those people. But Steve Running is on this, what's this inner, what's that committee thing? Well, intergovernmental panel, yes. Yeah, he's writing the report, the international report on climate change. And the state of Montana goes off and hires a consultant to come in and talk about what are the greenhouse gases in Montana, what should we worry about? And you have the expertise sitting right here who works on that around the world. And that's the kind of realization that I think we need to grab a hold of and, and provide facilities that will help them do their job. So that's it. So I got my props here. If anybody wants to look at this in more detail, I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions, Ron? I guess in listening to what Jim had to say and now you go, does the university need a complex or buildings that is dedicated to the interdisciplinary research and have the appropriate labs as opposed to, you know, Jim try to get labs, you try to get labs in. I mean, is there that overlap that, you know, the A facility built the right way, designed the right way to the appropriate space, uh, geosciences wouldn't need a, a different lab than forestry and these interdisciplinary functions could occur? I certainly don't speak for the University of Montana. And whether we need that or not, I, I would defer to my planning folks. But I would also say that such an operation would certainly contribute greatly to continuing the great work that we're trying to do and hopefully do some new things. But uh, that's, anyway, that's my view.
And, and just so you're aware, there is a facility that is going up to, uh, as we, well, it isn't going up yet, but it's out to bid and is going up on the campus and one of the sites that was identified in the existing master plan that is an interdisciplinary science um, facility. However, it, it is just a fraction of what the needs are. I mean, it, it's going to help. It's already basically It's already full. full. And um, it just, in the, in the space we had and the, the resources we had, that, that's what we could, were able to do. And actually, we actually issued bonds to do that. I mean, we're doing this with the, with the revenue bonds. Um, and it's the indirect costs from those bonds that are paying it back, from the grants, I mean, that are, that are going to pay this back. So we're, we're addressing it, trying to address it, but in a very small way right now. Other questions for Bill? Bob? Yeah, Bill, do you have an anticipated you know, square footage you would need in the next five, ten years? I don't, but I'm sure I could get you that number tomorrow. Okay. You know, I mean, it's the kind of thing that we have, you know, we, are, we haven't been dreaming too much, and so, you know, we're pretty conservative. We've been, I've been around a long time, but we know what we, you know, we know what we need in the sense of how we could grow and what the, and we're looking for opportunity. And so, but we could certainly figure that out, you know, and get you some kind of estimate of that. The clap building would make a great classroom. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't designed to put high level laboratories in. And when they move and renovate the second floor, they have even more labs in the second floor that they have, again, have to deal with about how are they going to keep this operation running, the graduate students, the undergrads doing research, training going on you know, basically the science going on and how are you going to move them someplace and have them function, keep functioning? You know, how's, how's that process keep going? We have no place to put any high level equipment like that at this point. That's our challenge. So. Other questions for Bill? Great, Bill. Thank you very much. Well, now I'd like to ask a very good who is the Dean of uh, the College of Technology to speak to the board. Dean Barry Good. Good afternoon. Um, two days ago, Reggie called me up and said, Barry, that's the name, Barry Just and said, I'd like to give you a short five, you can give a short five to ten minute presentation on the College of Technology, what we are, what we do, do we have any space needs, if we have space needs, basically what are we all about in five to ten minutes. So. You can take a little longer if you need to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do we go with that? Uh, when we're talking about the College of Technology, we are the two year branch or the two year part University of Montana out in Missoula. Okay? We are part of the university and we are again a two year a two year part of it. As being a two year part of it, a college of technology, really what our mission is without going into with all of it, but to go into the need of it, we provide certificate and associate degree programs. Those are one year certificates and two year associate degrees in programs. And this is an important, what I'm about to say, in response to individual, community, and economic development needs. That's what we do. We respond to the individual, we respond to the community, and we respond to economic and workforce development of this region as well as the state of Montana. Really, that is the meat of, uh, of our mission. In order to fulfill this mission, what do we do? We have a variety of different programs, and when I say programs, I'll be very, very broad and general at first. We have transfer programs. When I first came here, which by the way was July, so I'm really still pretty new here, people, what do you mean you have a transfer program? Why is a transfer program? I said, well, part of what we do, part of our mission in response to individual and community needs is that we offer an associate of arts degree which is a two-year degree, which is a transfer degree, which means basically that students can come to the College of Technology, take their first freshman and sophomore years, their first two years essentially, 
in college and then take those courses and transfer them either to the University of Montana or for that matter, because we are accredited by the Northwest Association, we can take those courses and virtually transfer them basically anywhere in the United States to a four-year college and university. So that's part of our mission. When I first came here, people, some people really didn't know that. As a matter of fact, many of our students, a high percentage of other students in the COT are in transfer programs, getting AA degrees, or take enough courses and they just miss the Associate of Arts degree and transfer anyway because that's what they really want to do. But that's part of our mission. Another part of our mission in programs, again being very broad in general, we offer occupational and technical programs. When we're talking about occup occupational and technical programs, we're talking about offering essentially different types of one-year certificate programs, we're talking about offering Associate of Applied Science degrees, an AAS degree, which essentially is a two-year degree. For the most part, when we're talking about AAS degrees and certificates, we're talking about non-transfer types of courses, non-transfer types of programs. People in these types of programs, students in these types of programs upon graduation, can go out and they do go out and they're quite successful with this actually, get jobs in the job market, okay? There's many different types of programs that we have and I'll mention a few in a little while. Another part of our mission, which is important, is really we serve as, if you will, an access point, or maybe I should use the term, the access point to higher education in this region. In this region. What do I mean by that? I mean that as part of our mission, we have been charged with taking students that are underprepared, whether they are coming straight from high school or they're coming back from the workplace, it doesn't matter. But after assessment, we find that they're not ready to go do college level work. It is part of our mission to take these students in different developmental programs and bring them up to speed where they can do college level work. So that's another type of program that the College of Technology um, is, involved, is involved with. Talking about the College of Technology physically, we basically have two campuses. We have an East Campus, which is, right near, which is not right near, it's next to Sentinel High School, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. And we have another campus it's called the West Campus, which is near Big Sky High School, way down on South Avenue. Okay, two separate campuses. <clears throat> the West Campus is primarily concerned with our industrial technology programs. And what do I mean by industrial technology programs? I'm talking about things such as welding. In fact, Bob Shook is here, program director in welding today. And I'm talking about diesel technology. I'm talking about heavy equipment <coughs> operation. Um, I'm talking about a new one, carpentry and building trades and building maintenance and things like this. These are the types of programs in which both certificates according to the program and AAS degrees are offered. As an example, right here in industrial technology. And I might say that we've been, the College of Technology has been very successful with this. We have waiting lists to get into welding. We have waiting lists to get in as an example to the, to the diesel technology program. Our students who graduate, from, who graduate from these programs, such as diesel technology, they're finding high paying jobs upon graduation. So it's working. That's part of, part of our mission. We are planning for space out there. I'll, I'll mention that right now. We're, we're up against it. We have waiting lists for students. Programs are carpentry and diesel technology. I mean, things are bumping into each other, and we do have space in the Okay, that's the West Campus. What about the East Campus? The one I mentioned that was next to Central High School. The East Campus, again, is primarily concerned with two things. It's primarily concerned with first, our transfer program, our associate of arts program. It's concerned with general education courses. And the department out there that's primarily concerned with that is applied arts and sciences. I didn't say arts and sciences. I said applied arts and sciences. That's where the transfer program is. Students take so many hours, transfer them to a four-year university. 
We also have many technical, I'll call it technical, uh, and occupational programs at the East Campus as well. As an example, this programs offer certificate and AAS degrees. Talking about such things as business technology, we're talking about two-year degrees in such things as management, accounting, sales, marketing. Okay, we're talking about um, paralegal studies, as an example. Also within the Department of Business Technology is a very successful culinary program. That is also at the East Campus. Also at the East Campus, we have basically all our health professions programs, which are highly successful. In great demand, we're talking about nursing, practical nursing, we're talking about registered nursing, we're talking about radiologic technology, surgical technology. We're talking about our program in pharmacy technology as well as respiratory care. All these programs are in demand. These people who are graduating from these programs, I assure you, are getting jobs. That is part of our mission. We are fulfilling the needs of the community and, and, uh, and, and the individual. Okay, so with all of that, what has that got to do with anything, right? Why am I here? Well, 10 minutes to try and say we have space needs. Well, let me give you an example of how the College of Technology has grown. And I'll start with 2004, and I can even go back further. But just from 2004, let me give you a head count, official head counts. Approximately, in 2004, there were 1,000 students in the College of Technology. That's 2004. Fall of 2004, 1,000 students. Really, there's 1,004. Approximately 1,000 students. Go to fall of 2005, I'm reading this so I'm, I'll be correct. In the fall of 2005, there were approximately 1,250 students. Okay? 1,250 students. And in the fall of 2006, uh, 2006 which was this fall, we had approximately a headcount of 1,480 students. So, if you go from 2004 to 2006, we increased by headcount approximately between four and 500 students. That's a lot of students, okay? Now, that is great. I think that's terrific. In fact, everyone at the College of Technology thinks it's terrific. We are fulfilling our mission. Students are coming, they are getting what they want, whether it's transfer programs, whether it's technical or occupational programs. We're successful, okay? But there's a problem. We're up against it. It's space. You understand what I'm saying? From 2004 to 2006, we went up between four and 500 students. We're not prepared for that. Okay? We're really not prepared for that. This is putting pressure on all our resources and all our facilities, including space. We don't have the room. We are up against it right now for just our existing program that exist right now, okay? If we're talking about expanding existing programs, or we're talking about going into new programs, new programs, and let me tell you, we have a list of them, which I won't go into, but I'll be glad to talk to you about, about them with you, which we would like to do. Where we, how are we going to do this? Where are we going to put these programs? Where are we going to put these people? To give you an idea right now, at the East Campus, we have a single wide and a double wide, which was purchased this fall, and in the single wide and double wide, and you're more than in the parking lot, okay, and you can go out there and take a look, we have faculty offices as well as part of our health profession programs are meeting the students in the double wide, okay? Why? Because we don't have a place to put them. This is, this is where, it's, where we have gotten to. Okay. Why am I here? We need a new facility. How do we get it? We need a new facility. And the truth is, we need new facilities expansion at the West Campus and the East Campus, both of them, okay? But today I'm going to be addressing really the East Campus, and the reason is the West Campus with our industrial technology programs, there's a whole other infrastructure out there, which would be very, very costly and difficult to move. So what I'm going to start to talk just real quickly is about the facilities, we need new facilities for the East Campus. We need at least a new building, 
Okay? Now, how we get that building is something else. We tried to go through, I understand, the legislature this time, but it didn't work. I understand we will be coming up to that in the next biennium. Is that right, Rosie? I believe. They typically, it takes a few okay. weeks, and the other colleges of technology around the state have received funding, and they're building new facilities, so they usually kind of tend to rotate around where they put So them. if we could get the funding for a new building in two years, then the question is, well, where, where do we put it? Okay, and that's what I'd like to address with the South, with the South Campus. We're going to have to expand our facilities with these campus, and it seems, at least it seems to me, it seems reasonable to at least entertain the idea that that new building, that new facility, should at least be seriously considered to go on to what I'm calling this area, the, the, the South Campus. And the reasons for that are, are a few. First of all, College of Technology now is becoming more and more integrated with what I would call the main campus of the mountain campus, okay? Becoming more integrated with transfer programs. Our students, as an example, in anatomy and physiology, go over to the main campus, the mountain campus, to do cadaver labs. There are students from the main campus or the mountain campus that come over, okay, to the east campus to take courses. And I don't know how it was eight years ago or ten years ago, but since I've been here, okay, this integration with the mountain campus is becoming more, more, and more. And we want to encourage that, and I believe the mountain campus wants to encourage that as well. To give you another example, we have 60, and I hope I, if I remember correctly, we have 60 to 80 College of Technology <coughs> students living in dormitories on the mountain campus right now, okay? See, this integration is really starting to happen. And it isn't that the College of Technology is separate somewhere or not. It is part, it is part of the university, and more and more it's, it is part of, of, the, uh, of the mountain campus. The reason why this at least seems reasonable is if we're going to have students between the East Campus and the Mountain Campus, and they're going both ways, if they're going to get the classes on time and everything else, then distance becomes an issue, and it is an issue. It's an issue for scheduling. It, it, believe me, it's a big issue. The closer we could get those entities together, the easier and more efficient it would be for the students, and basically that is what this is all about. So, with all of that, I hope I did what you wanted. Give a 10 minute presentation. I'll be glad to try and answer any of your questions. Yeah? Question. Okay. Is there any thought about combining the West and East campuses, or is the type of work that's done out at the East campus, West campus, excuse me, does it mandate that it stay in its current location? I don't know if it mandates it. I will say that the infrastructure, <clears throat> when you're dealing with diesel technology, you're dealing with welding, you're dealing with heavy equipment, you're dealing with, with machinery, machine shops and everything, to start taking that, all of that, and putting it somewhere else would probably cost a lot. We would, would cost, okay? The cost would be prohibitive. Yes, we could take the East Campus, perhaps, and put it somewhere out near the West Campus. But then the problem with that, and it is a problem, is now you really have a distance. You have separated the East Campus, which is becoming more and much more integrated with the Mountain Campus, and now there's going to really be an issue. How do students get from one to the other and do it efficiently and timely? And that could be a real issue. I was thinking more about bringing the West Campus to the East. It seems that because of the type of work they do, I, I know your heavy equipment have to have space to work, and if there was any thought to trying to integrate that uh, West Campus with something in this area. There's been talk about it, but to the, to the best of my knowledge, really, it hasn't been really entertained to bring the industrial program over to here. What has been entertained and seriously entertained, at least for now, is bringing the East Campus program for health professions, business technology, applied computing as an example, that's another example, <coughs> bring that over here. Not bringing over the industrial equipment, yeah. Keith? 
when you actually talk about the two buildings. Oh, does anybody know current College of Technology square footage? And the follow-up question would be, what are you looking at in terms of structure for the expansion? Okay. I think I wrote these down. Okay. Okay. We are excited. At the East Campus, okay, we have two buildings. The two buildings were built in, the, I believe, the late 1960s. They were high school buildings. Very little, if anything, has been done to update them. Where I am, in one of the buildings, there is no air conditioning. As an example, there still isn't. Um, high school, not really. I mean, yeah, no, some awesome. of them will see it. 1968 buildings. One building has a, an, a square footage of approximately 43,600 square feet. The second building, which is there, which we call the HD building, has a square footage of 26,600 square feet. Okay, and this was given to me from, uh, from our physical plant man, who looked at the schematics. So that's our East Campus. The West Campus, I have really, the way they he broke it out was three buildings. Some might be connected, but he gave me three buildings here. I have one about approximately 30,000 square feet, one approximately 34,000 square feet, and I believe there's one in carpentry, which is about 28,800 square feet, okay? That's really about where we are now. In addition, another part of that question was, well, what are we looking at, okay? Um, for square footage to expand for the East Campus for a building, what we were thinking about, okay, we're talking about was approximately, and this can go up or down, but approximately 80,000 square feet. That would be to house all our health professions, all our, our entire transfer program, our business technology programs, and our applied computing and electronics program. Yeah. How big is Anderson Hall? 54,000 square feet. There you go. Thank you. Barry, is there any, um, you know, we're talking about uh, integration between East and Mountain. Do the, any, do the students at the West Campus, do, do they pretty much, are all of their classes conducted out there? Do they have I won't, and, and Bob might be able to, to answer this. I won't say all, they do come to the East Campus, but I would say, I would say from my understanding, the majority of the courses on the West Campus are offered at the West Campus. Would you agree with that, Bob? It's a good thing you're here, Bob. That's why. <laughs> That's there you go. So this um, proposed building then uh, essentially has all of your programs that you currently have on East Campus? Yes, that is the idea. That is the idea. Now, it's part, I don't know, I and mean, the truth is, what about the building we have now, the two buildings at the, where we are right now, East Campus, next to the high school, okay, Sentinel High School? I don't know exactly what would I don't know what would happen. We do know that the high school has an interest in those though. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. The high, high school administration. Mm -hmm. Keith, did you Bob? Is there is there any room to add a building on the current East Campus? It's my understanding on East Campus we really can't there isn't really room to expand. That's what I have been told. We're up against it with Sentinel High School with parking. As soon as, as, soon, not really, as soon as the high school opened up, I met I met the associate principal and principal of Sentinel High School. Okay? There is no room. It's really tough. Yeah, it would appear that around your site, I mean you have athletic fields, you have the fairgrounds on one side, and you have the Sentinel on the other, and then you have the major street. <coughs> We had a real problem citing those two trailer modular trailers that they brought in last year. 
because there wasn't enough setbacks and everything, we had to put them in the parking lots and take up parking space for them. Because the, 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 that other surrounding land is the high school. High school. <coughs> Excuse me, we, we will have uh, public comment at uh, 440. And that's actually I, on the agenda. I won't be able to pay for that. I have to agree with city council. So. Let's okay. see. Are there other committee members? If we could first have other committee members. But how long that 8,000 square feet? You got that? How long that last? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay? I'm not sure. I don't know. Five years. Maybe five years. How many, how, how many expansion are we going to do with our existing programs? And how many new? programs, new programs, can be as an example of new programs, and really we're very serious about this, because there seems to be a need in the community for this, okay? And it's not my feeling, there's been some work done on this, some data, ultrasound technicians, MRI technicians, echocardiology technicians in the health sciences, okay? We're talking about a program right now and starting one up and we just started to get an advisory committee together for engineering technologies. Two-year degrees, two-year degrees in things like surveying, and things like man manufacturing and engineering, things like this. Okay, where do we put, where do we put these? And, and supposing it's successful and students come, where do we put them? I don't know, this, this is the problem. We're going to have to stop expanding and, and capping, pro capping programs because we don't have the space unless we start getting more double wires, which I guess is a solution, but it's... it's Where are you going to put them? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> in the parking lot. Take up more parking space. <laughs> have a high school riot. That would be pretty. I'll see the principal. <laughs> that's the high school. Ron. <laughs> Just a comment, too. I think Barry made a good point that they're kind of an entry funnel for all kinds of... We're, we're an access point. Yes. For all kinds of students. And knowing in the state of North Carolina that we don't have as many students going on to post-secondary education as we should have, at least compared to our surrounding states, programs such as you offer are critical to try and increase that percentage of Montana high school graduates that do go on to some type of post-secondary training. And I think that's another aspect of Mary's mission. Yeah, it, it was interesting at the Board of Regents meeting. Um, last week the governor spoke and he spoke to this exact issue and why he support he's supporting the legislature you know supporting funding for higher ed and it's that entire issue of we do a great job in montana of graduating students from high school but not just uh, compared to our surrounding states in nationally we are on the low end for students going on to post-secondary education and he is really committed to that and so we've seen money for equipment and things come in for specifically for two-year programs because of that and, and he spoke to this exact issue Teresa um, just in support of what Barry is saying of course every fall and spring semester the administration studies the enrollment that accrues over the first 15 days of the semester. Because at the end of 15 days, all the universities, basically that's the number we have for enrollment. Even if 100 additional people enroll after that 15th day, it wouldn't be counted in terms of the reports. And it's been clear for at least the last two years that the growth of the university is primarily at the COT. And so, there truly is a struggle as to how we continue to grow the program, which uh, exemplifies a need in the community when there's little or no space to do it. If the uh, South Campus or wherever the space became available, is that, I'm hearing there's a possibility that there would be funds from the state or somebody to build a building, or would that be another hurdle? Um, the process that, that you go through with the legislature is you submit requests to the long-range building program. 
what has happened if you, you know, you rarely, if ever, are funded the first go around. If anything, you get planning money. And what we've seen is, I think, two sessions ago, um, Kevin, Helen and College of Technology received um, planning money. This last legislative session, they then received money for their for for an actual facility, and they're in the process of constructing that. Prior to that, it was um, a Great Falls received money at their request. So, so if you just look at the way things have worked in terms of funding for College of Technology, it looks like there would be a very good chance that the next one to be looked at for for planning dollars and then ultimately funding would be um, the Missoula College of Technology because that's where there's been growth, so much growth. But you never know, that's all mm -hmm. up to the legislature. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that, who's to say? Is it yeah. possible that we can share spaces with uh, you know, the fairgrounds or the high school, those kind of things that we look into, those kind of possibilities? No. Not possible. not possible. High school would be full. That's the high school would actually would like to acquire the College of Technology, which really once was part of the high school, right? Correct. Right. You know, one time that was that was the vote technical education program for our high school. Nobody knows what's going to happen to fairgrounds. That's that crystal ball that somebody was talking about. <laughs> but the fairgrounds are in in line until such time as there's no more fair. I mean, it's just that the land out there, and that chunk of land that that's on, is, is exactly what you see. And it's just an awful fight to make any kind of rearrangement between it. the fields and the school system and the fairgrounds and the roads and everything else. You, it's just exactly what you see. Good questions from the committee. Uh, you know, um, Carol Brewer is on her way and should be here any minute. Um, she's another academic that's going to speak. But anyone that will not be able to be here um, at 440, um, I would be open to public comment. And I know that you have a city council meeting to get ready for, so. Well, for some of you to call me, I'm John Wilkins. I'm here for, I represent this area along with Jerry Bell. I was always wondering, do the the university actually own the East Campus, the land where the building is? Because I've been told different stories in that. Uh, I'm going to tell you what I, what I believe, but one thing I've learned is I will do follow-up. <laughs> one thing we've done as this committee is we, we've done research to get the facts. It is my understanding that, yes, we do. When COT was, was transferred to um, the university system, that at that time, the land and the buildings, those properties transferred with them. But I can't answer that for absolute positive, so what I, but I will do the research and make sure that um, I get back to you. And the follow-up, how, how much land does the university own and how to support the West Campus? And is there room enough to do a big expansion out there and keep centralize it all in one location? Um, if we went through that at our last meeting, we went through the various master plans um, for the university. And at this point, that's not an option for the these campus functions, simply because the land and the type of land. And, and Kevin, you could speak more to that. And then the other larger issue has to do with the distance. Um, the east campus is so integrated with the mountain campus that to try to get from Fort Missoula to the mountain campus is next to impossible. As I understand it, um, currently, I, I know students have enrolled for courses where they're supposed to go out to the College of Technology, and at this point, they have to drop them because they can't get out there and get back to their next class just be, just from from there to here. So it, it doesn't it doesn't integrate well with the mountain campus all the way out there. You won't be able to stay till 440. No, but I have, could I have three minutes for music? Yes. <laughs> As an academic area? Yeah, I guess you can. Uh, I've got a class, a class of students waiting for me, so. I, why don't you just let her speak real quick?
this way? Yeah, please. I, I think I can fly in three minutes, too. Okay, oh, oh, I'm this of the University neighborhood. I've been a faculty member here for 23 years. I'm in the Environmental Studies program. My program has grown tenfold in the years I've been here, but our space has been shrunk. Uh, we're, and, and they're proposing to shrink our space again. So we're losing space even though we're that vast of growing in size. I, but the main thing I came to talk about today was mainly that I wanted to hear from this committee at some point what your plans were to comply with the Montana Environmental Policy Act with respect to uh, the planning and development of the South Campus. The Montana Environmental Policy Act requires that all state agencies, including the university system, um, uh, evaluate the environmental impact of its proposed actions. And uh, that includes an environmental impact analysis, a public notification process. There's a whole process that's spelled out. And the university has, in my view, not been complying with the Montana Environmental Policy Act for many years. And, and here's a clear case where the Montana Environmental Policy Act is triggered by this, develop, by this proposed development process and yet I've heard of no plans to actually comply with the Montana Environmental Policy Act. So at some point I would like to know what, what the plans are to do that, but I do have to dash now because the students waiting for me. Okay, and, and actually, yeah, and I, as I can tell you, and I will find out, but I, I actually think there is um, some research and some activity going on in that area relative to, the, the plan itself is one thing. I, I, as my understanding is, is when you're actually going to do development, you absolutely have to make sure that that's, that's complete. Um, if I'm correct in terms of... The Montana Environmental Policy Act calls for starting that, that environmental analysis at the beginning of the planning process and having okay. it go through with it all the way through. When you're planning to do some form of development. Right. Okay. I, I'll do more research, but I do know, I will tell you that I do understand that is um, being looked into in terms of the entire Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I didn't, um, did you get her name, Karen? Vicki Watson. Watson. Oh, Vicki Watson, okay. FDVST. Yeah, okay. <coughs> and I would like to ask if you could please sign in as a guest book here. I'm Adams, I arrived in 1973 to chair the music department, and one of the uh, most frequent questions that was rang my telephone and my phone at home, my wife's up and I said is, where is the marching band? It had ceased to exist about three years earlier than that. Uh, fast forward a few years and you get Neil Buckley who builds a, a stadium. Fast forward a few more years and you get uh, Don Reed and we get championship football teams and we get a marching band. Uh, it took uh, a, a long while to get the marching band up to 60 members, and we had two suits of homes in the marching band. I looked out on the stadium this past year, and there's a line of 13 suits of homes. And I was talking to the faculty colleague, the former colleague, uh, about that, and I said, what on earth are you putting 13 suits of homes? Because kids don't buy suits of homes, universities provide them. And the answer was, well, uh, we uh, converted the orchestra library, and we put some books in there. I didn't even bother asking, where do you put the, the, the orchestra library? Uh, but, uh, so you have those kinds of very visible problems. So again, I want to suggest that the, the marketing plan is not central and, and critical to the academic life of the music department, but I think it's a visual that people can understand who, who attend games. But I want to do one other anecdote. In regard to the uh, cooperation of these two departments, I happened to have been here at the time that the university was trying, was changing from a quarter to a semester system, and all the the internal curricular challenges that, that created. And one of the challenges was these kinds of uh, uh, cooperative things that were happening between departments. And one was suggesting that in between the uh, portrait department of the schools, uh, you might sometimes you know, this group might, might need a course in hydrology, and another time they may one need one in entomology. And some wife from Fort Miami Department said, why don't you just do a course in water bugs? Excuse me, can you give me your last name? Your Simmons. Simmons. Thank you. You really did want to talk, speak to the music. Pardon? You really did want to speak to the music. Yes. Oh, thank you. Well, um, Carol Brewer is still not here, so I'm going to actually ask Keith um, 
If you would make me, uh, thank you very much. That was excellent. Um, if you would please, maybe if you talk about the needs of campus recreation, future needs of campus recreation. Thank you very much. Uh, as you know, right now we have golf which is fine. We also have a number of play fields, about 10 acres of play field. Um, and then there are some ancillary activities that go along with that. The landing area for the hang gliders, the cross country ones. <coughs> so when you look at the future, the only thing you know is it's going to get here. Um, we've looked at a couple of, of, of discussions about what we'll need 20 years from now. What will change? And you know, 20 years ago, I would never have said the cross would be popular. I would never have said that something called ultimate would even exist. Yada yada yada. But what I will say is that we're sure of a few things. One of the things we're sure of is the campus is going to continue to grow. There, every year we will have a few more students, and I don't know how many a few students is. It could be 50. It could be 300. But the campus and Western Montana are going to continue to grow. So looking at that number, we need to do something about our play fields and how we use them. So you can either expand horizontally or you can expand vertically. And by horizontal, I mean you add more fields and you use those fields at prime time. And prime time used to be from four to six, the academic schedule has changed, and now we have a lot of classes till 4.35, 5.36. So that does it. So what we're looking at are vertical expansion, and that means we're going to have to take one of these plats of fields at some point and light them and put on some surface that you could play seven games in an evening, which is like the stuff that's on the floor of Washington Grizzly State. And you'd light and when you look at that, and I, this is just, I'm throwing this out now. I think since this is in a residential neighborhood, in part, you'd be hard pressed to light these fields. But you would be able to light the river room and do some changes down there. So we're going to have to, at some point, think about lighting fields and putting on a different play surface. So that's number one. Number two, when you you look at the growth of our campus and the sorts of things that are happening, you have to look at some kind of a fitness facility out in this area. Um, one of my esteemed colleagues here was pointing out that they got to our facility at 6 a.m. recently, and it was packed. They were grumpy. So we have, we have quite a bit of use, as it is now with our current facility, if more housing expands into this area if the east campus expands somehow into this area we would think that a 15,000 square foot up to a 15,000 square foot fitness center that's not a basketball court or any kind of thing like that but a fitness center with some yoga studios weight rooms um, cardio equipment etc and in that center you could also in that thing you could also put some kind of a daycare facility because again we know that we need daycare space and with, with what's going on currently out here we know we need daycare space so you could put daycare in there and you could probably put some kind of a coffee shop grab and go i mean there already are adequate grocery stores quick service food stores there's three really good fast food stores that i think loved and i do too but so you don't need that, but you would need some kind of a little coffee shop or something. So in a 15,000 square foot fitness center, you could put some things in there. Um, we're also going to talk, and I'm going to speak briefly for athletics, but we're looking at tennis courts somewhere because of what's going on on campus. Outdoor courts, we need to have courts on the main campus somehow, but we don't know how that's going to play out. And there also may have some courts out here. We don't know how that will play out. Tennis courts are going to be an issue. We also need some kind of indoor facility for tennis and track for the campus community and whomever else. And along with that, this drives me nuts when I say it, but some kind of indoor facility for outdoor sports. 
<laughs> Did God not strike me there? <laughs> and when I say that, you know, it used to be you played three sports a year, you played four sports a year. That's what you did. Well, you don't do that anymore. Now you focus on rugby, you focus on football, you focus on cross, you focus on soccer. There's no such thing as a three sport athlete anymore. And it's the way it is. And our students are using a bunch of different facilities indoors in November, December, January, February, and March. They do. And we provide them the Shriver Gym. They do some really <coughs> odd things in the fitness center, driving Brian Fruit crazy. We still love him. But we have some issues. Varsity football has some issues. We have to file off this and that scale. So we're looking at some kind of indoor facility. So our lacrosse kids, our rugby kids, our soccer, you know, our baseball, all these students are looking for indoor space. So if there's some way of three or four groups, academic, auxiliary, athletics, working together to make some kind of facility where that could happen, it, it would be available. And like I said, when you look at the future, which is coming faster than you want to admit, 20 years from now is not that far away. I mean, I don't think that anybody thought 20 years ago that the University of Montana had 14,000 students. I don't think that anybody thought 20 years ago that Missoula, Montana would have a bridge over Reserve Street and there'd be shops out there. None of you said that because none of you bought land in Target Range. <laughs> it's just that simple. So when I talk about an indoor facility, when I talk about all those things, that's just trying to peer at the future and figure out what it is that the campus community and the community at large really need. I didn't say why. I said really need and would use. Thank you for the time. I'll answer any questions. And Keith, if I could, I'm going to just try to jump to Carol only, okay. only because I know that we've been asked do. questions. Please do. Um, and I don't want to have to ask you to come back from the meeting. <laughs> but I would like to introduce uh, Carol Brewer. She's the Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And she will be um, speaking to us about academic needs. Well, and your comments about um, 14,000 students really sort of struck to the heart of the needs that the, the college sees. Um, I brought a handout for the members of the committee, and I wasn't quite sure how many people there would be, so we send half and half, and I can certainly do more. Um, but the, the first part of this little handout talks in general about the College of Arts and Sciences and what the college's mission is. And it also gives you some information about the kinds of, of programs the college has. Uh, right now, we have a base budget of about $18 million with almost $25 million more in extramural support. And this uh, goes to support about 6,000 undergraduate majors in the college, plus all of the, the students across campus who take their um, general education and, and many elective credit hours in the college. Uh, in, the, in the college right now, we have some 750 graduate students who are actively engaged in, in research and scholarship. The college has 235 tenure-track faculty minds. We have about 40 research faculty and 105 visiting or adjunct faculty. So when I ask my colleagues in the college uh, what the future needs are for the college, a bunch of them said, well, you know, Carol, space really is the final frontier. <laughs> and so, of course, um, in terms of thinking about how to support the current programs we have, the increasing numbers of, of students that we're happy to have in our programs, a very active uh, faculty engaged in research, scholarship, teaching, and service to the community, there are, are many ideas that have come, have come up related to both on campus, south campus, and, and other places as well. And one of the questions that they brought up is, well, um, with respect to the south campus is, well, what 
are we talking about in terms of protecting the programs we already have going on on the South Campus? And then what's the opportunity space for new things um, on South Campus? I don't know how many of you take walks around South Campus, but you'll probably know if you do that uh, in particular in the life sciences, we really do have active programs going on on South Campus, and you can probably find our students and faculty out here um, every single hour of every single day doing something or another with uh, the plans that, that they're working on. Um, right now, today, the program in CAS that's probably using the South Campus the most is the Division of Biological Sciences. The South Campus facilities are extremely important to the biological sciences, and I think you had John Marin here, um, so I, I'm not going to repeat everything he said. But right now, we have a major research facility on the South Campus, three greenhouses, um, plants, uh, experimental plantings, and a, a new head house. And those facilities probably would cost something on the order of about oh, 500000 per greenhouse plus a head house, somewhere on the order of a million and a half dollars plus or minus to replace. Uh, this setup for plant research on South Campus actually started a really long time ago. And I don't know if any of you remember uh, the botany professor, uh, Professor Dietert. Some of you probably met him, some of you probably remember him. But I don't know, some 30, 40, 50 years ago, he planted a bunch of trees out here and set up uh, an experimental garden of sorts for those trees. A few of them still remain. I think some of them are, are compost under the University Village or, or the soccer field. But when the plants evolved for South Campus, the botany uh, group, the plant sciences group on campus identified another area where they located facilities. Um, these facilities work really well. They're close to campus. Our students can ride their bikes over here to work there. Uh, we also have facilities out of the fort. Um, the advantage of having facilities on the South Campus is that when things break down, which they frequently do, it's pretty quick to get somebody out to those greenhouses to get things repaired, and I'm sure John told you about that. Now, lots of our students do work out here, undergraduates, grad students, they're doing independent study research in those gardens. Um, Courses use the facilities right now, like plant ecology and plant, physi plant physiological ecology. So we're using them a lot as it is right now, and, and we want to keep using them. Um, they're very important to our programs. We've probably got somewhere in the order of $2 million in extramural funding from organizations like National Science Foundation, U.S. Department of Agriculture and others supporting the research out there. So they are very important in terms of extramural funding. Okay, well all of that said, you know, we really like the facilities we have out here, but if you ask us what sorts of things we might put out here in the future, um, well, it really runs the gamut from things that would still look sort of open spacey, if you will, to um, filling it up with buildings for um, all of the, the students and, and program, programs, academic programs were growing. So people in the college can think of uh, uses for the space out here that relate to teaching, research, service to the state, community outreach, and um, that serve a number of our departments. In the, the comments that I was able to gather uh, for you quickly for this meeting, most of the programs relate to the sciences, but there are some ideas that come from the humanities and the social sciences as well. Um, so if you think more on sort of the open space looking sorts of things, the kinds of, of programs that 
uh, colleagues in CAS would like to see expand are things that relate to our plant sciences and, and forestry research. Uh, for example, uh, there's a real interest in growing and teaching collections. And what this means is instead of just using dead plants on a piece of herbarium paper, uh, students would get access to um, research gardens that had um, plants um, for course, using courses like Rocky Mountain Flora and so on. So it would, it would be sort of a living herbarium. Um, we, can, uh, we have immediate needs for more experimental gardens where plants are grown outdoors in common garden sorts of scenarios. And if you peer over the fence out there, you'll see some of those sorts of plantings now. Uh, people also are interested in, in more experimental controlled conditions and uh, more greenhouse space. Um, that sort of work would certainly be supported by extramural grants to fund those kinds of greenhouse facilities. Um, there's an area that our faculty would like to grow into, and I, I don't know, did you talk today? I did. Well, I may say things that um, you talked about. We didn't have a chance to coordinate, but um, even some of our plant uh, faculty are interested in issues related to forestry. And in particular, there's an area in um, biology that faculty would like to move into, and this relates to research in tree biology and forest biology. And so if I'm saying things that Jim already said, you just stop me and I'll move on. You just spoke about your discipline. Ah, well, we had a lot of talk. I'm going to get you right to the trees. <laughs> um, you know, there is an experimental forest up at Lubrecht, and some of our faculty use that, but that's not really a very controlled environment. And there's a real interest in biology to get controlled plantings of forest trees going so that we can Look at things like disease, um, stress, propagation, which has implications um, for the, the timber industry, reading and wood products kinds of research. And what faculty need are spaces where they can have controlled conditions for growing different kinds of, of trees. Um, there are uh, trees in Montana that are facing stress to the point of, um, of threat. And white bark pine is one of those. I'm sure if you've hiked around western Montana and you've seen um, white bark pine, you may have noticed that it um, is really susceptible to a particular kind of disease. And we have a research program related to white bark pine, but again, we need some places where we can grow trees close to campus in controlled circumstances. So those are some of the examples from biology in terms of, of plantings that are used for research that still look maybe a little open space like if you're up in the South Hills looking down into the valley. Now many of you may be familiar with the PEAS program through the Environmental Studies uh, Program. This is Program in Ecological Agriculture and Society. This program runs several farms around Missoula that supply all sorts of food um, for low-income residents of our community. And they're very interested. They've been interested even in the past in, in looking at South Campus as a, a place for more of their activities. Um, and they would imagine um, some of the same kinds of facilities and, and farm agriculture like you might have seen up in the Rattlesnake if you've been up uh, on the, the west side of the Rattlesnake and seen their farm. So all of those are, are uses that you know, sort of look like plants um, rather than buildings. But uh, that said, we also have profound needs for our growing programs. And there are several types of centers that are under discussion right now that would require buildings. And, and frankly, I think if you um, hold individual faculty around CAS, they could come up with a whole campus full of buildings out here that would <laughs> 
jockeying for space for some of the other um, ideas that you've heard. One discussion that's going on right now in the College of Arts and Sciences is uh, coming out of the geological or the geosciences. There's, uh, there are plans underway right now for an Earth System Science Center. Well, I'm glad I didn't speak for the beans. Did you want to <laughs> yes, you did. No, keep going. That's great. <laughs> well, you know, see, we, we try to listen in on everything. And so um, you probably already gave them a bunch of information about that center, right? Right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so what our colleagues in the geosciences told us is that um, uh, facility is is needed to bring people together, um, very much from an interdisciplinary point of view. Um, this really does represent a very new collaboration in the college, and one that the college is, is supportive of, including departments with interest in, in uh, interest in the earth and ecological systems. So um, forestry, which isn't in our college, but um, they're involved. Uh, geography, the geosciences, mathematics, computer sciences, biology. Um, did I leave anybody out? Social sciences um, would be involved as well. Now, uh, bringing people together in this kind of a center really does require a new building facility. And um, the, the notion that something like that might be built on the south campus has come up. There really isn't space left on campus to grow programs and, and to put people into new buildings. Another idea that came up um, deals, and maybe some of you have heard about this, but in our creative writing program, there's been discussion of a James, what they're calling the James Welch House. And this place would be a place for performances and readings um, that would bring different parts of the campus and the community together in creative writing events. Students could present their readings, or could do readings of their work. Um, the eminent scholars in creative writing that are brought to campus could give their readings and, and do performances in, in such a space. So we can envision, depending on how this master plan goes, anything from growing gardens um, to planting buildings to help our, our programs grow and thrive. So that's all I have to present. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any kinds of questions. I think we'll wait to hear from you what the options are um, before we come in with square foot uh, proposals. But we will be ready to do that if that opportunity um, comes to us. So thank you for letting me come and tell you a little bit about CAS interest in this, this space. Thanks, Carol. Are questions from the committee? Or a lot. Carol, can you talk about controlled, uh, what was it, controlled circumstances for research? That doesn't always require a building, or does it require a greenhouse, or is it something that's just an outside plot of some sort, basically? It could require a greenhouse, but right now um, we've built a lot of controlled growth space. Um, but definitely there is a need for outdoor plantings to look at um, environmental influences on different combinations of plants and different sorts of experimental arrays. Um, that that is, um, as my colleagues have said, sort of an urgent need. There are these sorts of plantings out of the fort. They're not well controlled. They're always subject to issues like what we would call accidental deposits of extraneous nitrogen. Um, that's what happens when people walk their dogs. <laughs> But they're also subject to problems like people, you know, just driving over them. So having that space close to campus where you can have uh, more security around it is really a, a need. Other questions? We want to get more together at things. 
Okay, I think we'll, what we'll do now is we'll open up for um, comment from the general public. And again, we just ask if you'd please state your name before speaking and could I get a show of hands for uh, individuals that might want to speak? Okay. Well, so I just like to the last meeting and we did the big public comment. Um, I'm just hoping that I can make one last plea for the golf course. Oh, okay. yes. please, did you say your name? I'm Diane Higgins. And I would respectfully like to ask this committee to still consider this golf course and what it means to this community. Um, golf is, is a sport that lasts your lifetime. I don't think too many of our football players will be playing football into the 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s or beyond, but probably an awful lot of them are playing golf. We know that uh, it's an important activity in your adult and professional life, and I think you bear that out by the fact that the university provides memberships to the country club for some of the administration and faculty members. They, they obviously recognize that this is an important uh, skill to have and that the, the uh, Contact you make and so forth important so that they, they provide it. Um, but I just want to, I would just ask that as you approach this problem, you know, it's hard to argue against the academic needs of the school. There's, there's no question that they need to be taken into consideration. Uh, I would like to ask the question if they give much thought to growing some of these buildings up rather than out, uh, if any of these could have floors and so forth that would not take a bigger footprint out of the open space that we have right now. Uh, and, and that might be possibly one solution is to go up a few floors on some of these buildings rather than start a new building someplace else. But um, yeah, I looked at the master plan that was drawn up five years ago, 2002, mm -hmm. and it's interesting. It says preserve open space. The campus master plan should preserve and enhance kept campus open space and landscape as a signature characteristic of the University of Montana, Missoula. And it also says that the value of the community. The campus master plan should recognize the importance of surrounding neighborhoods and the relationships with the city of Missoula. So I'll just keep those things in mind because for those of us that are not intimately involved with the university, those things are all very, very important to us. Um, I feel that developing this land should be a last resort and not a first resort. That if you can possibly find ways to meet our needs and keep this land intact and, and use the way it is, uh, perhaps some of the, you know, the biological experiments that you were speaking of could be integrated around the golf course the way it is. But uh, it's such a temptation, I'm sure, for this committee to look at that open space and say, you know, let's go for it, rather than say, what are our needs and can we do anything to preserve this first? Because once it's gone, it is gone. And you don't want us to look back 20 years from now and say, what a shame. They, they ruined something that was really an asset to this city and to this community and to this university, and it's gone forever. And that's really what I want to say. Just please don't forget us, because this is important to a lot of us, not just those of us who use the golfers, but your students as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And one more, one more, one more. I want to thank this committee for allowing us to speak, because this is important to us. So thank you for giving us this time. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, for the record, my name is Rob Parker. I'm uh, both a graduate student here, and I've also lived uh, in the area of Missoula for four years, and uh, before that, for the majority of my life in the Platinum Valley. Um, and I, I wanted to offer a comment, kind of as a student and also as a resident. Um, and I, I'd like to apologize in advance to uh, Mr. Woosner and uh, Mr. Good. A couple of examples I come up with might sound like they're very critical of, of your needs. Um, <laughs> But I, I understand that you've got so many bright, well-trained people coming up with ideas for how to use this land. Um, and I, myself, have worked on a political campaign to get bonds for schools to expand. So I know the value of these ideas and the type of impact they can have on the community. Um, so I want to say that I think they're really great ideas. And I don't, I don't mean to demean them at all. I think they're all excellent ways to use this space. But I think anytime you're talking about developing public land, um, you're talking one about irreparable change uh, to that surrounding, um, but you're also talking about um, certain types of values in the community. Um, 
And no matter what you come up with, there's always going to be a more profitable or a more efficient way to use that. I mean, that's the very idea of setting up sides, because there will always be arguments that we can do something better, more creative, more efficient, or more profitable with this land. Um, and, and I think, again, they're good ideas. Um, but unfortunately, I, I don't think the need justifies the type of long-term costs that both the community and the university are going to suffer. Um, and I'd like to talk about a couple of examples, one from the Flathead Valley, one from Denver, Colorado, and then, uh, and hopefully I only need about five minutes of your time. Um, but I, I've golfed all over the country, and I've golfed in the Flathead Valley, and growing up in the Flathead Valley, uh, none of my friends golfed, nor did they ski. When I went, went to public school during the day and told them about golfing, no one knew what that was like. And there's a reason for that. It's because most of the golf courses in the Flathead Valley are championship prize golf courses. These are exclusive golf courses. I've also golfed at places in the inner city in Denver, Colorado. Uh, and I've also golfed at some public golf courses where they'll drive trucks out and put targets on them for people to hit. Um, this is, these are more inclusive golf environments. And I think there's a huge difference between the types of courses that are elitist um, and require $50,000 uh, fees to join $100,000 yearly green fees there's a big difference between those and public golf courses where anybody from the community can come and golf. And I think that a lot of the social division and the rifts in our society that people sort of attribute to golf as it's a rich white man's sport are undone when we have public golf courses. Um, in, in the city of Denver, um, if you look around the, the Denver City Zoo, which many of you may have been to, this is a giant golf course, a city municipal golf course. And if you think the ideas you've got to develop this space would be more profitable or efficient, I'd like to look at the history of, of the developers who've been foaming at the mouth to develop this section of downtown Denver. But the city is continually protected it for one reason. It's in the middle of one of the lowest income, uh, racially diverse uh, neighborhoods in Denver. And it's a public golf course. And for a lot of people, this is the only place that inner city kids will even ever know what golf is. Uh, and, and maybe have a chance to join. Um, and, and that's the kind of value that I think is attached to public golf courses. And as a university, I think you need to think about a couple things before you do this, and they're just the only two things that I'm really qualified to talk about as someone who's worked in public relations and in politics, is there's going to be a huge both political and fundraising fallout from this when you permanently put aside this land because you're effectively cutting the university's ties with the community. You're taking something that used to be of access to the general public, that allowed the university to say we were a partner in this community, we allow anyone access to our facilities, and it's taking just one more piece of those, that public trust and removing it. Granted, for very good ideas, ideas that will make that land more profitable and more efficient than it is now. Uh, but I do have to stress that politically, there will be fallout from this, because the community will see that a very strong piece of evidence that the university is cutting off a piece of itself from the community. Um, Secondly, I think there's going to be a big fundraising follow-up from this. Um, I got my master's degree here, and I'm currently a postgraduate student um, in the geography department. Um, and I can tell you, uh, geosciences work. There's great ideas for how we could use this space, but we need somewhat ambiguous. I mean, I work in this field, and I can tell you that our work has gotten smaller. We now work with disks that hang around our necks, and we work with databases that are in computers. We no longer deal with huge plotters. There's, if you go to SS258 right now, in the middle of the geosciences complex uh, where the GIS work is done, there's a half of a room right now that's filled with old equipment that they don't even use anymore. Just junk. The other half of it is filled with computers, which is what we use now. Um, with uh, cutting edge software. Um, and my, my point is, is that the need, there's always a need and there will always be excellent ideas to use this space more creatively and more profitably. And I hate to be critical of what, what is certainly in the geosciences department. But always evaluate that piece very critically because the fallout that you're looking at long term in terms of fundraising loss that you're losing from, from people who grew up in Montana, who are, go back to the area, these are people who donate money to the school. When they see that there's one more piece of the school that's been taken away, they feel less tied to the school. They're going to be less likely to want to give money to it. Uh, and I think that there's going to be a bad PR fallout from this as well, because you're going to have your critics pointing to the ambiguous cases that are drawn up for, for the need for this space. Well, everyone needs the space, but opponents are going to have a lot of ammunition to work with when they say, 
Well, all they really did was take what used to be, you know, something that was for the public and use it for their own needs. Um, and I think that idea of public trust and the, the type of long-term costs that the university is going to incur uh, for making this decision are uh, very considerable. And I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I might just be brief. To emphasize how important what that man was saying, I'll take you back to when I spoke about a month ago and asked you all to remember that day in May 1905, 2005, when that borough was jammed with people objecting to destroying that golf course. And they weren't all golfers, not by a long time. They were citizens of Missoula, and the fallout would be terrific in my opinion. Very good. Thank you. And you have Dottie's name, Carol. I thought we trained you by now, Dottie, to say your name first. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Bob Shook. Uh, is there going to be other opportunities for public comment? <laughs> the schedule right now um, is that our next meeting, and I will again make sure that I'm correct on the dates, which is the 19th of March, not yet, like they said earlier. That meeting is a working meeting. That's a working session meeting. Um, and we will be actually um, working at that time. Our, then our other meetings are scheduled at this time, just as they are, have been. They are on the meeting schedule on the website. The next one after that is April 2nd. April 16th, April 30th, May 14th, May 29th, June 11th, and June 25th. At this point, whether those meetings will be working sessions or meetings like this, we haven't laid that process up. But definitely there will be more meetings of this nature and there definitely will be opportunity for uh, public comment. Again. Yes. And I just encourage you to go to the website because all these meetings are there. Okay? Jim. Could you define the working session? I'm not clear on how that differs from, from what we've experienced today. Well, primarily what, uh, what we've been doing, and, and I really have to thank this committee because they've been very patient in listening and understanding what the needs are, both the current need, the current uses and the future need. And, and, and really felt that was critically important that to do any kind of planning, you better first have the facts and understand what the current uses are, the history of the land, and what the potential future uses are. And we have not gone through all those because we do have campus rec, athletics, and other. And we'll probably address those at the first part of the next meeting, which is a working session. But I would tell you, if you're interested in listening to that, we'll probably take those up first. But the working um, is for, for us to now really start to get into the actual working, because we haven't done anything that actually starts to look at what the plan might be, or what we might recommend, or what what will happen. Um, and that's really, that's to start that process. And that's what the working session will be, is to, to um, start that process. And Bill Wilmot will be here, and he will facilitate that. And so at this point, that's what the working session is. We're kind of, as we kind of move along, we'll try to develop the agenda and let everybody know what's what's up next. Well, the this is a part of like, like a table, a diagram, we get to move buildings around. And well, I don't know yet. We all have to. I don't even. We have not even laid it out yet in terms of how exactly that's going to work. But we've gathered enough information now that the actual working and planning phase of it, it really, we're ready to start to begin the discussion. But I, I don't. I can't tell you because I don't know yet. Okay. Great. Any other questions, comments? I just had a quick question. You had athletics on the schedule today. Are they going to? Like yeah, I just there, there's there's three areas that, that we've not totally covered. We haven't given um, Keith the opportunity for questions. We have to cover athletics, and we also have to cover other. And there were some other. I know alumni have some issues they'd like to raise um, and bring forward. And then there will be time for other kinds of potential future uses 
to be discussed. And so based on the fact we haven't gotten through all that, I, I'm probably going to ask that the first part of the working session we will use for that. So anybody that's interested um, in hearing about that, I would encourage you to come on April 19th. We'll probably use the first part of that working se session. March 19th. March 19th. March, March 19th. Oh boy, I'm really confused on these days. I'm sorry. Um, so, that, so we can address that as well. Okay? Because we do need to hear from you as well. Okay? It's 5 o'clock. We're done. Thank you.